So this slide is not for you. I am assuming you all know who I am. Uh, this is slide is for the video. Um, it's also for my mum because she likes seeing my name on the TV. Uh, but before I begin today, um, we've all had lunch. It's warm. We need to kind of wake up a little bit. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? Go! So, just to make sure you're actually watching now, um, but did you also see that I changed my shirt? Right, so there are things happen in our place and we need to constantly be aware of them. Um, this was a tweet I sent to uh, some friend of mine. Um, what's my job? It was Joomla. Uh, what's my hobby? Uh, Joomla, what do I think about when I'm not doing Joomla? Um, I think about thinking about Joomla. So Joomla is absolutely part of my life. And some of the things that I'm going to be talking about in this presentation, you might think I'm directing them at you specifically. And because I do tend to look around and focus on people as I talk, it could be that I say something and you think, I am talking directly about you doing something wrong. That's not the case. I've just happened to be looking at you. So I'd like everybody to read the terms and conditions to excuse me from that. So I don't want anybody at the end to come up and tell me that I was rude to them. Uh, so if everyone's going to agree that you've read those, um, we can continue. But it's also true to say that every time you point a finger at someone to say that they've done something wrong, there's three fingers pointing back at you. So if you remember that, next time you're suggesting that someone's done something wrong, or that they could do something better, or that they should be doing something, there's three things that you should be doing at the same time. So this presentation was called The Volunteer Ladder. Oops. No, it's me. There are lots of ideas how you can change the world. Some people think you should just complain about it. That won't change the world, it will just make it mad. Some people think you have, have lots of money money. Make it rain everywhere you go. Holler for a dollar. Some people think you have to be really loud and yell a lot. It's like with a bullhorn shouting. Hey you, yeah you, do it my way right now. You heard? Other people choose to just make fun of everything. That's dumb, that's dumb, everyone's dumb. It's easy to make fun of stuff, but it's cooler to make stuff. Some people think changing the world can only be done by the smartest person in the world. Just put them in a room, let them figure it out. The solution of world hunger? Food. Wow, that was like so amazing. Some people see the bad in the world and they just decide to ignore it. But that won't help anything. Some people think you have to be really famous and super cool. In fact, lots of people think you have to be really powerful to make a difference. Like being mayor, or senator, or president. But the truth is, a title doesn't make you more important. The world is changed by you. It's one person filled with love. And they just have to live it out so they do something awesome. Then that person is filled with love and they do something awesome. It just goes on and on and on and on. And the next thing you know, everything's awesome. Some people think it's impossible to change the world. It's impossible to change the world. Well, you can see why they could think that. Living in the world with kids who are hungry, people who are homeless, families weren't happy. 
I'm just trying to figure it out like everybody else, man. But I do know this, though. The next time you feel overwhelmed or totally alone, remember this. Things don't have to be the way they are. The world is changed by ordinary people. Little people living out big love. And that's what gives the world a reason to dance. So, how do we change the world? You help prove that the internet can be an awesome place. Thank you, but we're not done yet. This coming year, let's show the world what awesome really looks like. <laughs> so, uh, that's Kid President, and in there he was talking about how we change the world. But, and that is kind of what Joomla does for me. It's like part of changing the world, changing the world that we live in. Making, for me, Joomla is all about m giving people the opportunity to build a website with, with limited tools or limited skills or limited money that's as good as if they had all the money in the world. And we do that by volunteering, by volunteering our time, our energy, our effort into making Joomla better. The question is, how are we actually dealing with this volunteering? That's what this presentation is all about. Now, some of you may know, but I actually at the moment suffer from really bad insomnia. Uh, two to three hours sleep is kind of about all I can get in one go. And getting to sleep is the real problem. I've tried all sorts of different things, different tablets, and it gets incredibly frustrating. And the more frustrated, you must have been there, you're lying in bed, and you just can't get to sleep, and you've got the whole world going round and round and round in your head. It just goes on and on, and then you can't get to sleep. So I discovered that YouTube was great for getting me to sleep. I started going to YouTube and watching videos, lectures on mathematics, on nuclear physics, on particle physics, on psychology, on stuff. Ten minutes, I'm asleep. Awesome. But those people that sell you those motivational tapes that you play while you're asleep, I thought they were cons. I think they're real because I'm really learning stuff about m particle physics and, nu and nuclear science and all sorts of other stuff, especially about CERN, uh, the Large Hadron Collider. I've learned a lot about that, uh, mainly because it's those presentations by the other Brian, the one who's not quite as famous as, as me. Um, but I'm not going to be talking about that, but I am going to be talking about three different areas that I've uh, really learned a lot about over the last few months. Uh, yeah, sorry, it's not one, it's three. So we can trick things. If you look, from, it's the same photo, two different photographers. Things can look different depending on which side we're on. So I'd say I'm going to talk about three different things. I believe that Joomla is the largest volunteer organization in the world. And I don't just mean volunteer software organization, I mean volunteer organization. Because we don't have a single person who is paid by Joomla. Not even a secretary, there's no one paid. I can see Jan sitting there, he's going, I'm sure I must be able to think of one. If you can, come back and tell me afterwards. So, we have to say then, what is a volunteer? What does it mean to be a volunteer? Well, the dictionary, says it's a person who freely offers to take part in a task. It also says it's a person who works for an organization without being paid. Now, there's some dispute you, that whether you can be a volunteer and be paid, but we'll move on from that. But this is the problem. What is a good volunteer? Now, we tend to say that a good volunteer is someone who gives lots of time someone who's a hard worker, and someone who has a big impact. That's a big mountain to climb to become a volunteer. I think this is wrong. To me, this is not what makes a good volunteer. So what do I think it is? So this is the first person that I'm going to talk about who I've been learning about through the internet and YouTube. His name is Maimonides. Uh, he was born in Spain. And he was the greatest Jewish intellectual of his time, uh, but not just about religion, about medicine, about philosophy. Uh, he worked as a doctor. He wrote in Hebrew and in Arabic uh, and in Spanish. Huge, huge documents and books. 
that are still being looked at today. Some of his works on business ethics are still being studied at universities today. And one of the things that he talked about is that there are eight levels to charity. And the highest is when someone helps, uh, is when you help someone to help themselves. So I took this, and I'm going to change it from, the, from charity to volunteer, and take you through the eight levels of being a volunteer. So this is level one, the grumpy guy. Uh, they do it, but they wait to be asked every time. And they do as little as they can possibly get away with. And never, with, happily, never with a smile, go on, if I must, you've forced me, you've twisted my arm, and they do it. So level two, the next level up, again, they wait to be asked to do it. And they still do as little as they possibly can. And level three is the same, but this time, they do a little bit more, still waiting to be asked to do it, but they are smiling. Now they're not, they're sure you know it, just ask me to do it any time, I'll do whatever you want, just ask me. Okay, this is what levels one to three is all about. Whoops. Levels one to three, it's always you have to be asked, you, you want to be asked to do something. So that means that somebody else, instead of, in our case, maybe writing code or writing documentation, instead of them doing that, they have to spend their time looking for volunteers to do things. And not just looking for a person, but looking for a person and asking them to do something specific. And they have to do that all the time. And the problem with that, that's not sustainable. It's not a good use of our time to start looking for everybody else, and we need to change that mentality. We need to change that mentality so that people can find, can volunteer, and that they can find an easy way to connect. So level four, um, they do volunteer before being asked. Maybe they look at the issue tracker, maybe they look at the forum, and they start asking for th doing things. Level five, they actually start to do even more. Yeah? There's one difference. People in level five, they want some sort of reward. That could be money, it could be a badge, it could be a title, it could be a recognition, a leaderboard. You know, the top forum contributors. You know, they want to be listed in that top ten list. That's what they're doing there. Level six, you can see this guy's silhouette face. They're doing as much as they can. They don't care about reward. Yeah? They don't care about the list. And really, this levels four to six, where you're doing it without being asked to do it, this is the model that we should at least all be trying to get to. This is where we should all be looking at being, how do I volunteer? Do I wait for someone to ask me to do something? Or do I just go ahead and do it? Do I look to see what needs to be done and just do it? I don't need, we're a voluntary organization. We don't need someone's permission to submit a pull request. We don't need someone's permission to test a bug. We don't need someone's permission to do a doc thing. So what are you waiting for? Yeah, just do it. And so four to six is really where we want to be. Of course, I said there were eight levels, so what is level seven? Level seven is the person with completely unlimited time, they've always got a smile, and they do it all without being asked. And that's really the best we can ever hope for from everybody. But level eight, what is level eight? Well, level eight is doing something that helps other people be better volunteers. So let me give you some examples, I'll give you one example that we have now, and then later we'll talk about some possible new ones. So the issue tracker was written by a few people. By writing that issue tracker, they've made it much, much easier for anyone testing issues, for anyone reporting bugs, yeah, than it would have been with GitHub, especially three years ago, no more when we switched to GitHub, there wasn't the tools in GitHub that there are today. So they're at level eight because they have empowered other people. Their small piece of work has r had a ripple effect to move on to everybody else. 
So I think that the definition of a volunteer is someone who helps others to do and be more than they are already. And that's what's important to me. So that's the first topic. Yeah? That's the first part of the uh, volunteer ladder. It's Maimonides. Now, another aspect of volunteering is how we communicate to each other and the language that we use. And yes, I am very well aware that some of this is, is three fingers pointing back at me. Thank you, Robert. So I, so I could now deliberately make a terrible pronunciation <laughs> of Schadenfreude. So what is Schadenfreude? It is when we take pleasure in other people's misfortune. When we sh really enjoy seeing a tweet like this one and the whole internet retweets it. <laughs> yeah? Are we, we're not being nasty to Nicholas, but we're really enjoying that of all the people that could mess up their backup, it was him. Now, Nicholas is great at this, and I'm sure Nicholas is not minding me sharing this picture. But it's not always quite as good. Oh, I didn't have this slide twice. Sorry. It's not always as simple as that. And quite often, it can get personal and people can take offense. Now, the Schadenfreude, is it now three fingers pointing back? Okay. Uh, Schadenfreude is one of those words that doesn't have an opposite. There is no reverse in German or in English or other languages, the opposite feeling. So, but there is in two languages. Uh, one is a Southeast Asian language, which I've forgotten for now. And the other one is Hebrew. And in Hebrew, there is a word, fear gun. It's not gun as in bang bang, uh, but fear and gun. And it means take being, taking joy in something good that's happened to somebody else. So instead of looking for a tweet from Nicholas about when he did something bad and laughing at him, retweeting something that's happened that's been good, some taking joy out of their success, yeah, for no other reason than to share that joy. Example might be this tweet I found. It just says, David, you're the brightest crane in the box. Your goodness shines from your face like sunbeams. No specific reason for that guy to s send that message other than pure, unselfish joy in what they'd achieved. So if we start to think and to celebrate people's successes and to share each other's successes and not just spend time sharing our failures and our accidents, it's going to make a much better atmosphere. I started doing this recently, so if you actually check the hashtag fear, fear gun, um, there's probably only, there's not very many, and they're mainly me. Um, but that's kind of what it is. It's sharing in other people's joy. It's changing the way that people think about what they're doing. How, how am I being a volunteer? If my being a volunteer is about just making other people happy, yeah, that's really nice. It's really nice to suddenly get a thank you message for something on a Facebook or LinkedIn post from someone and you have no idea who they are. No idea. Never met them. Don't recognize the name. It's not someone you've done something for directly. But maybe they had a bug and you answered it. And they said thank you. And that's what it's all about to me. So that's the sort of the second theory that I gained from the videos, Schadenfreude. Only a small one. Now, the next one is the big topic. It's called nudge, or nudge theory. Can I just, very quickly, who's heard of nudge theory? 
Okay, so that's really interesting. Not that many, and the guys from the UK at the front, much higher percentage. Because in the UK, it's become a big thing. Nudge theory is not about gamification. Yeah, that's not what it's about. Nudge gamification. So let me go back. Go back. So first of all, nudge theory is about changing people's behaviour. And what can we do to change people's behaviour in a good way, in a subtle way? Things that we can do by changing language. Yeah, and we'll see some examples. It was originally developed as an economic theory. It was actually all about shopping. But it's become more than that. The reason why the, I hope the reason why the guys in the UK knew about it is because the, the British government, before they got messed up with Brexit, decided to in, create a whole department about nudge theory. And how can we change our lives? So they've done things like changing the donor, uh, organ donor card system. They've done things about taxation, all sorts of things to change people's behavior in a positive way. But it's not about making a game. And that's usually what we see in the software world. When we're looking at encouraging people to do things, we make a game, we do a, a user tracker activity report, we do the most for, a forum posts leaderboard, we have a documentation most edits page. Yeah? These can be useful, in general, I would say they're not. Um, they're useful for short-term things. This was a code sprint that we did in Manchester. And that was our, our, our tracker report at the start of the weekend. And then, as you can see, we gradually were updating it and all the rest of it. That was great. That absolutely, over that weekend, acted as motivation. There's a second chart, which I'm not going to show, but that one has, was our individual ones. And it got to the point, at, I said we were finishing at 5 o'clock on Sunday. At 4 o'clock, I think Victor Vogel decided that he was going to win. And he's desperately doing stuff. Nicholas, on the other hand, is not going to be beaten by anybody. <laughs> In the last hour, the two of them were really going at it. To the point that when we stopped, it was even. And we went out for dinner, and I spot Nicholas underneath the table with his mobile phone trying to write a pull request. <laughs> <laughs> so can gamif gamification can work. Yeah? It works in limited ways and specific circumstances. Because you can get to situations where somebody's been there for a long time, so of course they've got more reports than you. Yeah, of course they've done more, ticked more tasks than you. You're never going to be able to move up that ladder. So that gamification thing on a long term is not great. A nudge is not about making it a game. What nudge is about, as I said, it's about gently suggesting a, the correct path. Gently pushing people in a direction. That might be by reducing options. It might be by clever terminology and words. So this was, I, I'm guessing a lot of people might have seen this video. I think it was in Sweden. Um, they changed the staircase to look like a piano. They, nobody used that staircase before. Everybody used the escalator to go up and down. When they put it in, that was fun. They were all going up and down. They loved it. That imp what's the benefit? That improved people's fitness. Every day, the exercise of going up 20 steps is good for you. They were you were nudged in the right direction by making the piano. Nobody was telling you, you will be fitter if you do this. But that was the intention. So this is another example, Campbell's Soup. This is the biggest soup brand in the USA. Uh, they've done quite a few different things with nudge theory. Uh, this example, they, Campbell's Soup is the, is the soup that the Andy Warhol posters are from. And uh, I think it was last year or maybe the year before, they did a whole range of soups using his original 
artwork. And so they turned a 75 cents can of soup into a collectible. But how did they really, what did they really do as well? I don't know if you can actually, uh, you can't see it on that one, sorry, on the next one. You can see here four limited edition cans. So what did that do to their sales of soup? It went up by a factor of four. Because everybody wanted to buy the Andy Warhol artwork. And you don't buy just one, you buy all four. In fact, because people didn't open those cans, if they actually wanted a tin of Campbell's soup, they bought five, four to keep and one to eat. So that was one thing that uh, Campbell's soup did. The other one that they did to nudge you in a certain direction was they did a test in a supermarket, you know, with those giant pyramids of cans. And it said, Campbell's soup, 50% off. Yeah, sales went up. Then they put a, a pile, and it said, Campbell's soup, 50% off, limit to six cans per customer. Created a scarcity value. People, instead of just going, oh, that's cheap, I'll just get one. It's, oh, that's cheap, I'm going to get a lot to keep them in, so they're ready. So they nudged you in a certain direction. Uh, dull pineapple people are also really big at doing the nudge thing, but really that's just there so that I can say ananas. We, for some of you from two years ago will remember that. Uh, this is the most famous nudge that maybe some of you have actually experienced. It began at Schiphol Airport. They had a real problem that a lot of men seem to find it incapable of actually urinating inside one of those things, and they want to spray the floor instead. So, <coughs> they put a sticker of a fly in the urinal. And all the guys would go, ooh, psh, can I get the fly into the bowl? And they Cleaning bills, whew, straight down. Men could suddenly, they had a reason to pee on the right direction. So they didn't put a sign up that said, please pee in the urinal, don't pee on the floor. They just nudged you with a sticker. While I was looking for this photo, I did discover that people have gone a bit more crazy. You can now buy political figures' faces to stick into the toilets. Uh, but you can also get real games. <laughs> yeah, this has a, there is a little floating, I don't know if you can see it, there is a little floating ball, and you can score a goal by getting the ball in the net. <laughs> this one is one you'll have seen. I forgot to check if this hotel had it, but I'm sure you'll have seen it. The, by the towels, there'll be a sign saying, please help save the planet by reusing your towel. One of the big hotel chains did a survey and they discovered, yeah, sorry, they discovered that about 30% of people do reuse the towel. So that's not bad, but they wanted to see could they increase that number. And they changed the message from being a generic one that's mass produced, they probably do the same one for every country in the world, they changed it to that. 75% of all guests in room 304 reused their towel. And it went up. It was personalized. I'm also in room 304. I don't want to be, oh, I want to be at least as good as everybody else. And maybe even better, I don't want to be seen as the one who's not doing things. So how do we get to use nudge in Joomla. Is there a way that we can actually change some of the things about how we organize and run and volunteer and contribute to Joomla using nudge theory? I mean, I think we can. The, perhaps after, after this session is kind of an unconference and sprinting, and then tonight we have the speed dating. The speed dating. This is an opportunity for you perhaps to think about some of these ideas that I'm going to share with you and maybe even implement them.
because they're all, the thing about nudge theory is it's all about little changes and little changes having big impacts. So one of the things if we look at, uh, this is the volunteer portal, right? Supposedly it lists every person who's a volunteer in some way in Joomla. It doesn't. It, vol it lists all the people that took the time to click on a button to say that they might possibly be a volunteer in Joomla, that's all. But on here, we actually use this in Joomla for it to list all those people who are active members of Teams as a part of the same thank you. But does anybody ever go to this site to see those thank yous? No, not really. Why? Because you've got no reason to go. Now, one of the things that ends up happening is people become badge collectors. Yeah? You click through the, t the lists of the people who are, who are listed as being on teams, and you will find certain names on this team, this team, this team, and this team. We can't do that much stuff. We don't have the time to do that. We're kidding ourselves if we think we can be actively involved in more than one or two teams. But we see people being in six teams. What does that mean? They're just collecting badges. And what do you do when you collect more badges? You just have to buy bigger jackets. But it doesn't make you a better contributor. It doesn't help Joomla. Now, also on the volunteer portal, we have this board. It says, Help Wanted. Has anyone ever seen this? Right, very few. Yeah? Uh, if you actually go from the main www.joomla.org site, you have, and you want to volunteer, you will have to go through about five different clicks before it would take you to this list. Yeah? So you, that's a kind of a strange thing. Maybe someone wants to have a look at that. How can we reduce that click-through rate? We all know more clicks, the less people are going to get there. And what do you get here? You just get a long list of job titles that somebody on a team has decided we need. And what are they doing about it? Well, they've put that thing out and they sit back and they say, job's done. Yeah, I've got my team now. I've defined the positions, but I haven't got anybody to participate in it. So how can we tell people that this team wants somebody? So one idea might be when you register on the volunteers' site, asking you what your skills are. And then and you, if you answer with certain things, maybe it gives you a nudge to say, did you know we're looking with for someone with that skill in this team and pa passing them the link? Perhaps that's something we can do. Now, one of the other reasons to go to the volunteer portal might be to read the reports that teams make. We've got to get people onto the volunteer portal to see the jobs, ad, the jobs that are needing to be done. So one thing you can do is see the report. Of the 38 teams, formal teams that exist in Joomla, not including sub-sub teams, only 50% of them have published a report in the last 12 months. In fact, if I go back to just including 2018, it's down to 30%. That's like maybe one paragraph, but every time you go to the volunteer portal and it's updated with this team did this and this team did this, it's interesting, it's engaging, and people will go back to read tomorrow to see what reports will be done. Most teams are not reporting anything. There is no way for anybody to know whatsoever what the production team have in their minds. It doesn't exist. Yeah, there is no way you can go and look at what the Joomla 4 template team had done in the last five months. It's not there. It doesn't exist. And I just choose those two purely at random. I could say the same thing about lots of others. There's other teams that have never, ever reported. Now, does that mean they're ghost teams? That they don't actually really exist? There's one or two, possibly. They've served their purpose, or they Ne it never happened, and they can just be removed. It could be that they're really, really busy, and they're working on lots and lots of exciting things. But they've not told anybody. They've not shared that. 
they've not made you interested in helping. Yeah? Of course they can come to you and say, Andy, can you help me on this job? But I said, that's levels one to three. We want to be higher. Andy wants to say, I've seen that job that you're working on. That's really interesting. I can do that. But he doesn't know what those things are because nobody's reporting. If we just spend, if you're on a team, if you just spend 10 minutes to write one paragraph each month, then you can do that. It's exactly the same. We have the Joomla Community Magazine. A Joomla Community Magazine also is an awesome place for you to write reports about what you are doing, what you're interested in. Maybe it's, not even, maybe it's just an idea that you've got, and by doing that, you're nudging somebody else to say, that sounds really good. I can help you with that. That's something I would like to do. But if the idea just stays in your head, nobody knows. If you wait until you get to JM Beyond or wait until you get to Joomla Day to talk to a few people about it, it's too late. And of course, who are you going to talk to? Either the people that you already know, which probably means they're the people that don't have any more time to help you. And the people that do have the time and want to help are the people that you don't know. That's, you've never met them before. It's kind of a hard first conversation to have with someone. I want you to help me. Yeah? So spread it out. Don't do it all at once. How about this for an idea? Joomla Forum. When you go to the Joomla Forum today and you click New Post and you write your question, how do I do this? What happens next? You press Submit. And then you sit there and wait and hope that somebody answers it. Wouldn't it be nice if it, when you click post, a message comes up and says, while you're waiting for, for somebody to answer your request, why don't you click here and look at these other questions that people have got? Maybe you can help them. So just a little nudge to change someone's behavior, to stop. That's changing them from being a consumer to being a volunteer, to being a contributor. The Joomla issue tracker could be done exactly the same way. Yeah, we can automate a lot of things. Yeah, we can automate your, wow, that's great. Thank you very much for your first pull request. We can automate, thank you very much for your pull request. We've just merged it, and it will be in Joomla 3.x. It's creating a feeling about things. And nudge theorists know if you say that language is incredibly important, and it's not just about the words that you use, but the tone of the words and, and the personalization. They know that if it says simply, thank you very much, it gets a response like this. If it says, thank you very much, Brian, I feel even better, it's personal. If it's actually signed by somebody that you know, not just the Joomla team, but a real person, it gets even better. It's encouraging people not just to submit that one pull request, but to be interested in submitting lots more. It's the same we, on the issue tracker. We also have one of the things is we have a facility for people to record that they have tested that code. And we can't move on until a certain number of people have tested that code. When the code's merged into Joomla, they don't get thanked. They should do. Yeah? So not just the person that wrote the code, but everybody that worked on that issue, whether that was testing, whether that was a comment about usability, everything. Each time we personalize the message that we give out, we increase engagement. We're nudging them to be more involved. We're not doing the Wikipedia model. Wikipedia, every year, is it January when he puts the giant message at the top of the screen, give me money or I have to close. And it's there December. December. It's there all the time. Yeah? That's not nudging you. That's begging you. Yeah? We don't want to be begging people to contribute. That's not positive. We want, we want people to want to contribute. 
that's what it's all about, doing it with a smile, doing it without being asked. That's the only way we can do things. That has to happen. Yeah, if Joomla is to move forward in any way, we have to change the way that we work as an organization in terms of how we contribute to each other, how we contribute to the work. That's what we need to do. We are not alone. Yeah? We should, the whole point about Joomla, what does it mean? It means all together. We should be doing this all together. Thank you. <laughs> Amelia's joining in as well. We want to do things all together. That's what matters. We are much more powerful and much more effective if we do things together. I want everybody to do things together. One of the things that, for me, is a massive disappointment in the Joomla project is actually our teams. Because I've got no idea if this team has ever even existed. But it's just a label. They've never reported. Yeah? There's no visible signs that I can see. And I'm pretty involved on online a lot. I don't know. I'm not saying that team hasn't done anything. I'm saying that nobody has asked that team to make a report. And maybe they have asked them to make a report, but they never have. So that means that the leader has failed again because they didn't go back and say, I asked you to write a report. You haven't done. Please do it. Tell people what you're doing. Yeah? Don't say, I'm too busy doing all the rest. I've got so much to do. I need more people to help me. I've look at this list I've got on that jobs vacant thing. It's huge. I need more people. Nobody knows what you're doing. That's a fault of all of us. But it's a specific fault of people who are taking leadership roles in our community. Yeah? You cannot take a leadership role in our community just to wear a badge. Yeah? You take a leadership role to be a leader. Yeah? And we, there's different styles of being a leader, but it is not about being able to say, President, Vice President, Secretary. As the little, as Kid President said at the beginning, that's not what it's about. Yeah? It's also not about being the smartest person in the room because everybody can contribute in some way. Our people who take leadership roles, that is their responsibility. They should be leading. Yeah? They should be guiding. Yeah? They should be directing. And I'm not saying with a whip, I'm saying with a nudge. Yeah? Just nudge people along. We've got a lot of the tools and processes in place to do this. We're just not doing it. So in conclusion, what I want to say is let's nudge. And you can do that this afternoon. Thank you very much.